Good evening, Good evening and welcome to March 25th, 2020, Facebook Live stream from the Stanislaus County Office of Emergency Services. This event will be recorded and posted on the Stan Emergency page on Facebook. My name is David Jones and I'll be moderating this evening's forum and I will not be appearing on camera, but you'll be hearing my voice helping us navigate through this stream this evening. The goal of tonight's program is to update you on the current response to COVID-19 in our county, to respond to questions that have been coming into the Emergency Operations Center, and the focus of the evening then this will be on taking questions from members of the public and responding to as many as we can joining us tonight will be mayor ted granville from the city of modesto stanislaus county sheriff jeff dirksy and stanislaus county public health officer dr julie weishan payan who we refer to as dr v thank you all for joining us this evening dr v we'll start with you for a quick update on what is happening today in the covid 19 response effort yeah, yeah, so, so uh, um, today we have 12, 12 confirmed, confirmed uh, uh, tests positive, positive for Stanislaus County residents and, and no deaths. Right, thank, right, thank you, Doctor. Well, let's, well, let's jump, jump into it. We've had a lot of questions that have come through in regard to testing in Stanislaus County and to try and understand what is going on with testing, how we do it, and what is the context of really the rest of the country and the rest of the state. Um, question number one is, are there enough COVID-19 tests kind of to go around at this point? Yeah, so in the perfect world, uh, we would like to test everybody who wants to be tested, who needs to be tested, but no, there are not enough tests to go around right now. Um, there is a shortage of many uh, things in the supply chain for testing. Uh, one is the swabs. The swabs to even take the test sample are in very short supply, and there are many other parts of the testing process that are um, not, not readily available. Are those, are those shortages unique to Stanislaus County, or is that something that's being seen in other places? Yeah, yeah. No, no, it's actually worldwide. Um, the, uh, sorry, sorry. Um, so, so there is a problem with testing worldwide. That it's um, the, the everybody's having problems getting the swabs. Everybody's get, having a problem getting some of the reagents for the testing. So it's not just Stanislaus County or California or the United States. It is worldwide. Yeah, I'm kind of not surprised with the massive amount of testing that is underway around the world that those challenges would be seen. But with that, though, knowing that if there were more tests available throughout the state of the country, people would want to have those tests, how are we responding to that in California? What's our approach to testing based on a limited supply? Right, so what we're doing with the counties in California is we are testing people where we need to know to make a difference in spread. So. Um, People who it makes a difference on our recommendations for preventing spread to others are such as people that live in congregate settings. We need to know so that we can prevent spread to others who live in those congregate settings. People are in the hospital so we can make sure that they are um, kept in isolation and the healthcare workers taking care of them are, are appropriately protected as they care for those people. So those protocols that we have in Stanislaus County, how does that relate to, let's say, most of the other public health departments in the state of California? Yeah, we're pretty much all using the same guidelines for testing because we're all having the same um, constraints in the testing process. So a lot of questions that we've got about testing are, you know, why aren't we testing everybody? And you know, so one of the questions with that would be, why, why aren't we testing anybody, right, everybody at this point? It sounds like that's because of the shortage. But in a perfect world, what, what would we be doing? Well, in a perfect world, it would be great. If everybody that wanted a test, needed a test, could get a test. Absolutely, that's true. Um, but right now, that is just not available for all of us. Very good. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, so at this point, is there anything else on testing that you would like to share? Um, no, I think that covered most of the testing questions. Okay. Great. Thank you. So let's step back just a little bit to talk about the COVID-19 virus itself. Um, and this is a virus and not a bacteria, correct? Right, so this virus, um, we haven't known about it for very long. I, every time I'm talking about this, I talk about how it was January 7 when it was announced, I think, that was announced that they discovered what this virus was that was causing this illness in China. And so it's been only about two and a half months that we've known this virus exists. So we are working hard to understand this virus. There's things we know, things we don't know, but um, it's, it's very early on in trying to define this disease. What are some of the things that we do know about the virus at this point? Is it something we've seen before, something similar that we've seen, or is this just like radically different from other viruses? Yeah, so everybody's learned the household word coronavirus. So I mean, it's a coronavirus, it's a beta coronavirus to be actually more specific. 
Um, so it causes respiratory infection. These coronaviruses cause um, respiratory infection. They infect through your lungs. And so, yes, so we have coronaviruses that are endemic or circulating every, every winter in, in the United States. Um, they cause about 30% of the common cold. So it's not unusual that we see coronaviruses here. There are a couple other more serious coronaviruses that have emerged um, in the past 20 years. So everybody pretty much heard about SARS that emerged in 2002. And then we have MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome that was first identified in 2012. And so these coronaviruses, they kind of keep coming out and um, emerging and infecting people. And this one is, uh, as opposed to some of the other ones, easily spread person to person. So is one of the challenges that Granted, it's a virus, not a bacteria. Is one of the challenges that it's just brand new. And how, what does that mean in terms of do we have immunities in our community, or why does it make this especially challenging? Yeah, so that's always what the problem is when a new um, virus emerges, is that in general, it is assumed that nobody has any immunity to this virus. So the entire population is susceptible. Take that to flu, where we know people get infected every year. We have a, a vaccine that it gives people immunity, and so we get a lot of immunity from either previous infection or vaccine. But we don't have those with these viruses, and that's the challenge that we face with this virus. It's one of the challenges. So with the coronavirus, um, who can this impact? We've heard a lot about the elderly and people with compromised immune systems can be uh, particularly susceptible and at greatest risk. Is this still the case, or what do we need to know? So, um, I'm, I'm, I'm smiling at the elderly, because it's 60 and over, and you know, most of us here aren't gonna call that elderly. But yes, so um, every, anyone can get it. Like I said, nobody's immune, and so everyone can get this virus. Um, anyone can get severe disease with this virus. Anyone can die from this virus, That that is a fact. People that are more likely to get severe disease and more likely to die are people who are 60 years and older. Um, and the older you are, the increased risk that you have. And then people with some underlying medical conditions, a lung disease, it's, it's a lung virus, so people with lung disease who already have lung problems don't do as well. Um, people with heart disease, uh, diabetes, and people with weak immune systems, weak immune system as well. We've heard a lot about young people thinking that they're not susceptible to this. What are we learning as more information starts to slowly become available and how the virus is taking hold in communities around the world? Right, so young people are absolutely can get infected, right? Um, just because you're less likely to have severe disease doesn't mean it doesn't happen, and it can happen to anyone. You know, we, we talk a lot about flu um, and each year in flu season, and we have the classic risk factors that we talk about with influenza as well, um, which is older age and underlying diseases. But every year, young, healthy people die of flu too. So it's not that you can't have severe disease. It, it can really cause severe disease in everyone. How sick can people really get from the coronavirus? So um, we talk about you know, about 80% have mild disease. And mild disease, not to downplay mild disease, you're home, you have your regular illness, you know, if you think of influenza and other respiratory diseases, you get a fever, you have a cough, you know, it can kind of feel like your throat's burning. It, you, you can be pretty miserable, and we call that mild disease. Um, when you develop more severe disease, like you're having problems breathing, and you need to go to the hospital to get support for your breathing, like get some oxygen, um, the oxygen that you're breathing. Um, so those are some of the more severe things that happen. And so it's primarily around your lungs, and you, you, you need your lungs to live, so. You referenced the respiratory side of this can be particularly difficult if you're susceptible to this, or if that's an area where it just particularly attacks you. Um, how bad overall is public health looking at how this could potentially be in the community? How significant of an impact do we think this could be on residents of Stanislaus County. Right, so if 80% um, have mild disease, so it, it therefore follows that 20% of the disease is not mild, and so it can, uh, somewhere between 17 and 20% so far are hospitalized. And so if you are talking about an entire susceptible population, 
Um, and the people that get it have a one in five chance of being in the hospital. Um, what, what we worry about is um, ill people overwhelming our healthcare system. Not having enough beds for those who are sick and need hospital beds. Yeah, we're gonna have one last question related to this before I move to some of our other panelists tonight. How long is this going to last? I mean, what are we thinking in terms of Stanislaus County? People are staying at home right now. We know that there are some cases that are starting to show up in testing. Um, how long do we think this is really gonna be impacting us uh, in the near future? It, that's a really hard question because since it's a new virus, nobody has seen how it acts. Nobody has seen what happens in warmer temperatures. Um, like many other respiratory viruses, nobody knows. But looking at other countries, um, like China, um, like Japan, like um, Italy right now, it, it probably to have our peak and come down and feel like we can start reopening services is probably gonna be about six weeks. Do you anticipate that number changing depending on what happens, or when we think of six weeks, what is that, how, right. is that a hard line in terms of that number, or what are your thoughts? Um, the hope is that the more we stay home and don't mix and don't spread disease, the shorter that time will be. Um, so we're hoping that six weeks, I, I think six weeks is a good planning tool, uh, but no, it's not a hard line. We have to see how this virus reacts, how it works in our community, how it's spreading, um, and, and, and make decisions based on that, how our healthcare system is doing. Uh, it, it's just, there's so many things that, that we have to look at to make that decision, and it's just gonna be something we, that we have to keep watching. Great, thank you, Dr. B. We've had a number of questions come in before in regard to what's happening in terms of enforcing the governor's order to stay home, so Sheriff, I think we'll throw this one to you. Uh, what is being done right now to, uh, in terms of enforcement with that governor's order to stay home? Well, so there's a number of uh, different things that we're doing about this, uh, but let, let's kind of back up and talk about the order itself and some of the the challenges that surround this order. Uh, so there's, there's four different components that we have to uh, analyze as we look at this. Uh, first is the order itself. Uh, and let's be very clear, the governor has every authority uh, to issue this order. There have been comments that they got that's unconstitutional, that he can't do that. That is not the case. This is well within the law. The governor can issue this order. Uh, so that's one fact. And the order itself is, is relatively straightforward. But the second fact that comes into play is that uh, we have to take in the governor's intent and the comments and the statements that he made when he, when he issued the order. And he specifically said that he did not want this to be a law enforcement function. What he wanted was social pressure. Uh, and social pressure to get everyone to do the right thing, and that's to stay at home and comply with these orders. Uh, and that has been confirmed by kind of the third component with interacting with our colleagues at the state level and getting their input, and they have done exactly that. They have verified that the intent is that this not be a law enforcement function. And then, and the fourth component of this, and, and this specifically revolves around what are essential businesses, that are, or the essential functions. And with that, we have to reference the, the uh, state's website with the 16 essential functions uh, that they uh, provide in them. So when you take all of that into, into effect, um, there are, are many, many businesses that, quite frankly, fall into that, from that definition, that broad definition of essential function. But we really want to focus on a, on a few that, that are specifically prohibited by the governor uh, and with the definitions that he has provided. And uh, I'm going to talk about four primarily that come up the most. Bars, gyms, nail salons, and restaurants that are still open for dining. So our target around that initially has been an educational phase, is, is uh, blasting it out on social media, informing the public as much as we can about what the expectations are, what's in the order, and trying to provide some clarity around that. The second phase is going to move into an enforcement uh, phase, and we are there. Uh, but I want to be very clear that we are, we are trying to, again, get everyone to do the right thing and not make this a law enforcement function. So this, uh, this enforcement is starting off with a relatively soft approach. Uh, we are contacting businesses directly. 
uh, specifically those that uh, you all, the members of our community, have reported to us. And we have an email that we've uh, provided uh, by some of the moderators in the comments of this, that you can report those businesses for us to act on. The first thing they're gonna get is a phone call. The next step is gonna be a visit in person uh, with uh, a supporting letter issued by either the appropriate cities or the county uh, to tell them to cease and desist in alignment with the governor's order. And uh, this has been successful in several of the other counties. So some of the Bay Area counties, uh, they started under their own local orders several days before the governor issued his order. And this is exactly the same process that they started with there. So they're a few days ahead of us. And that has been quite effective in getting those businesses to shut down. And here's the one thing that everybody has to remember. Those businesses are only open and they only have people in them because you, the members of the community, are going in there. So if you know someone that's going to these businesses, ask them to stop. Uh, that, that is part of this idea of social pressure. We just want those businesses to close. The, the goal here is compliance with the order, not punitive action, and that's what we're trying to get done. Okay. Thank you, Sheriff. Next question is for Mayor Brandfold. We know there's a lot of activity that's taking place within the cities and coordinating with the county right now. Uh, so what the question is, how are the local cities working together to make sure there's kind of a coordinated response to this effort? Uh, how is that looking for you in terms of working with other cities and the county? Well, as far as cities, and at least as far as mayors too, we're in constant contact with each other, exchange of information, exchange of ideas uh, and thoughts on, on what we're dealing with here. Uh, we have a daily meeting of all the mayors uh, and the county uh, to go over the current situation and, uh, and updates. And we're in constant contact on this and constant conversation. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, here's a question from the feed right now that's come in. This is for Dr. V. Dr. V, can we visit our elderly parents or should we stay away? It's, 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 these are hard times, so you should stay away. You should not visit your elderly parents because you do not know if you're going to bring COVID-19 to them. What I would suggest is using the technology we have. We have FaceTime. We have Skype. We have, I don't know, so many other ones. Basic telephone, yes. So um, there are many ways that you could connect and use this time to connect with family. I actually think this is a great time, looking at the positives, to use to connect with family and, and, and have, have time that you don't usually have um, to really spend time with those you love. Thank you. Next question will be for the sheriff. Uh, there's a question about price gouging. We've heard rumors that there may be price gouging that's going on. Are we seeing that in any places at that point? Are we aware or what can be done about that? Yes, uh, there, we have gotten reports of price gouging and uh, not rampant, which I think is great for our community. I think that speaks to the character of the folks that live here. Uh, but yes, we have had reports of price gouging. And with that specifically, the district attorney's office is gonna handle uh, those investigations uh, with her staff. So if you want to report an incident of price gouging, again, we'll post the information for you to contact the district attorney's office directly uh, via email and report that type of incident. Thank you, Sheriff. Next question is for Dr. V. This comes from our feed. This is what we're seeing a lot of media on right now, and that is potential treatments that are showing up. And so one of our viewers can I ask, will physicians prescribe z pack hydroxychloroquine, and with positive tests? I probably mangled that name, but basically there's a lot of new things that are coming out, or there's some treatments that potentially show promise. You know, what do those look like right now? Yeah, so that's really hard to say. Um, yes, I, and I know that President Trump touted um, that uh, treatment, but uh, one of the problems is we don't really have good studies that use it. This is what we call anecdotal data. It was used a few times. It seemed to work. But what we really need to do is compare it to like people where it's not used to see if it really worked or these people just happened to get better. So. We actually don't know that it's effective, and I think it's a bit dangerous to be using things that we don't know is effective. So I can't answer the question of whether a physician will prescribe it because they have autonomy and they might do that. But in general, it's it's not FDA approved for this, and um, 
I think it should be done under a study to see if it is effective. Great, thank you. Mr. Mayor, question for you from one of our viewers tonight. This is in regard to disabled seniors. One of the challenges that has been for seniors right now is uh, with the stores initially were very, very crowded. It seems to be slowing down a little bit. It was challenging for seniors to get there. And toilet paper, there's been a huge run on toilet paper. So the question is, where can disabled seniors get toilet paper? I might suggest that they try uh, the, what is it, www.loveourneighbors.org. Uh, that's an organization that has been set up uh, by our Love Modesto group that will put people in need uh, in contact with people that are able to help them out. So uh, that's, uh, and they're doing a great job out there. So as a follow-up with that question, Mr. Mayor, there are a lot of nonprofits I know that are trying to help during this time. Love Our Neighbors is one of those. If people want to help out, if they're home, they have time, and they're interested in volunteering, do you feel like they should reach out to those nonprofits to see if they need assistance right now? Well, they certainly should. I actually want to remind uh, you know everybody in our community that social di distancing doesn't necessarily mean social isolation or disengagement. And I'd I'd, imp I'd really encourage everybody to be engaged, especially with our nonprofits that that are doing so much to support people at this time. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This next question is going to be for the sheriff. So, Sheriff, again, this is uh, coming in from one of the people watching tonight. Is there a curfew in Stanislaus County right now? No, there is no curfew in the county, uh, and there are no boundaries. I've had questions in the past of boundaries on, uh, like, the, the county line, you know, between the cities, anything. No, none of that is in effect. You are free to move about at any time. Obviously, if only uh, if you are an essential worker, if you're going out to one of those essential services. So that's the key thing that everyone has to remember. Uh, but no, there are no curfews, no boundaries. And if I could, uh, I know we've also had many questions about uh, traffic stops. And we've had reports that the National Guard is out there doing traffic stops. Those are false. The National Guard is not in Stanislaus County. Uh, they may travel through de delivering food or other supplies, but they are not here in Stanislaus County and they are not doing traffic stops. Uh, none of our local law enforcement agencies are doing traffic stops related to this. You may see traffic enforcement as part of our routine duties, but it's not related to this incident. Great, thank you, Sheriff. Uh, next question from our viewers for Dr. V. Are there any new symptoms that we're learning about associated with COVID-19? Well, actually, there, there have been a few things that have come out lately. Um, loss of smell was the one that came out in the past week that um, it was a British group that talked about loss of smell. It's very early, so we don't know that that's um, going to be consistently seen, but that has been seen. Um, there is some, you know, GI symptoms like diarrhea and nausea that have been described, and that might happen. Um, but those are the two new ones, not new, the diary is not new, but the, certainly the loss of smell is a very new one that's, that's come up about in the last uh, week that's been described. You know, tied to that question, one of our viewers wants to know if there are any new complications or problems associated with the virus that we're learning about right now. I haven't heard of any, um, so I don't think so. Uh, one of the questions is if you get pneumonia and severe pneumonia, um, how does your lung function recover and how long does it take? So those are questions that still have yet to be answered because that's one of those questions that time, it just takes time to be able to define um, um, lung recovery. Great, thank you, Dr. B. So next question coming in from a viewer for the sheriff. Are you gonna process CCW applications, concealed weapon applications faster to help citizens protect themselves? Yeah, so on this, the, this has been a point of discussion all week. I, of course, have had a ton of questions about this. And uh, actually, by tomorrow, at noon, the staff actually has to give me a, a, a plan and the plan on how we're going to do this. We do have the ability through Permedium, which is our online system, to send out a mass email to that effect. So that will be going out by Friday. Uh, but the intention, we are not closing our lobby and we are not stopping processing of our CCWs. It's all by appointment only. And we have some very good protocols in, uh, in place already for social distancing and so on. Uh, as an essential service, there's many things we always have to do for the public. 
And so we will uh, continue with processing our CCWs. That being said, there are going to be some modifications uh, and that will go out to everyone by the end of the week. Great, thank you, Sheriff. Next question will be for Dr. V. Uh, the question is, if someone is preparing takeout food and they are infected, can you contract COVID-19? So, um, first of all, people who are sick um, should stay home and not be at work. But um, if they're worried about this being foodborne, there is no evidence that this is a foodborne virus. It is a, a virus that you inhale. It is airborne. So they don't usually infect in different ways. So we're not concerned about the food. All right, so question for the sheriff. Has there been an increase in crime, holdups or break-ins that we're aware of throughout the county? No, actually there has not been. And specifically, we've actually seen a reduction in calls for service and overall reduction in crime. Uh, and again, I think that speaks to the character of the people in our county. Uh, now, what I will say is this. Uh, we did have a report of a possible protest coming here to Stanislaus County, uh, and we are concerned about the potential of looters, especially for any of the businesses that are closed. Uh, and I will say this very clearly. If someone is going to use this incident, this critical medical emergency, to commit criminal activity, regardless of what it is, I can assure you that there will be very, very strong and swift enforcement of that. Um, and. Uh, we are very, very much aware of it and on the lookout for it. And specifically to the businesses that are out there that uh, are concerned uh, with break-ins, you can go directly to the Sheriff's Department uh, website on our homepage and you can request extra patrols. We have a whole team that is dedicated to going around the county and checking on any of the businesses, schools, other things that, are, uh, other facilities that are closed so that we can help ensure uh, your safety and the public safety and the safety of your property. Great, thank you, Sheriff. Next question is for Dr. V, and it's, all of these right now are coming from the, the feed, so thank you very much for sending your questions in. We'll try and get to these as quickly as we can. So Dr. V, are you working on priority testing for first responders? So um, in our um, testing that goes through the public health lab system, we talked about people who are hospitalized, we talked about um, people in congregate living settings, such as uh, nursing homes and things. Um, in addition, it's healthcare workers and first responders because we have to keep those services up and running. And um, for reasons of spread, we do need to know if healthcare workers, ambulance drivers are infected. And so they are on our um, list of people whose testing goes to the public health lab. Great, thank you, Dr. B. Next question will be for the sheriff. Uh, sheriff, will Stanislaus County be releasing inmates? I think we've seen this in other counties around the state. Is that something that we're considering in Stanislaus or looking to implement? No, nope. uh, absolutely not. We're not considering that at this time. Uh, we have taken steps though, uh, both to reduce our intake and to uh, also protect the inmates that are in our custody. Uh, so specifically in reducing the intake, uh, we are have worked with uh, obviously our agency, but also all of the law enforcement agencies across Stanislaus County. And most of the misdemeanors, those who commit a misdemeanor, will be cited out in the field. That, that is still an arrest. Uh, they will be arrested, but they'll receive a citation with a court date uh, and a notice to appear in court. That cuts down on the number of inmates that are coming into the jail, uh, which helps us with our capacity. It also prevents uh, potential vectors of uh, coronavirus from going into our, our custodial facilities. With that, we have implemented medical screening uh, for any inmate before they ever even enter the building. Uh, we've always had medical screenings, but we've expanded that. It's actually outside of the building now, uh, and they are screened before they ever set foot into uh, any of the facilities. Again, to prevent the spread of uh, any coronavirus uh, or the entrance and spread of it into our facilities. Uh, but no, at this point, uh, we have absolutely no intention of releasing criminals back into the community. And we're doing this to protect the community. Great. Thank you, Sheriff. So this next question will be for Dr. V. So we know that we're blessed in Stanislaus County. We have really good health care here in terms of some very high-tech hospitals that we have, tertiary facilities, which can treat some of the sickest patients. 
So we know a number of patients come to our hospitals from outside the county to get care. Do we have kind of an exact count of how many patients our hospitals are treating from outside of the county? So um, by communicable disease reporting laws, the answer is no. Um, by communicable disease reporting laws, um, these are reported to the county of residence of the person. So I am not notified by local hospitals if they have people from um, other county residents in their hospital with this with this uh, infection. So no, I actually don't have a count of that. I'm okay, with the same question, in terms of if it was with any condition, would we know in Stanislaus County at any point in time through like the emergency operations center, how many patients in that hospital, even if they're not related to COVID, are from outside of our county? Um, I don't know that information. No. Okay, no, that's fine. All right, next question. Uh, for Dr. V as well. Um, do they expect schools to reopen on April 6th? Yeah, so no, we don't expect schools to reopen on April 6th. Um, we are following the same timeline as we think for um, the duration of this, like we spoke about earlier. It's probably going to be about six weeks before we're going to be able to start opening up um, uh, activities that are, are not happening now. So, I mean, opening up businesses, opening up schools, it's, it's going to be about six weeks. We've got to wait until we go up to our peak activity and come back down before it's, it's safe for us to start mingling. And one of the ways I've talked about this before, like at the Board of Supervisors, it's, it's our social networks. So every time we make a change in the people we're interacting with, we are increasing our risk of getting infected, right? Because it's new people we don't interact with. So when kids were in school every day, that was their social network. Those are the people they were interacting with every day. And so they were less likely to get infected. And we were concerned with canceling schools because now they're going to mix with people they're not used to mixing with. And it could possibly increase risk. Well, now that's the same true of opening up schools. So we need to make sure that the activity is very much down and spread is decreased to a very low level before we want people to start mixing again in, in the ways they haven't been. I'd like to follow up on that question. Yeah. You used the term social network, which yeah. people might think about it in terms of Twitter or Facebook, yeah. but there's an actual context of what a social network means in your daily living, not electronically. What yeah. is the social network for individuals? Right, so for most individuals, it's the people in your house, the people at work or school, and the people that you're regularly interacting with uh, every day. Those are, those are the regular people that you're in contact with every day. So that's, that's the people you're used to seeing. And so with the social network, if you're regularly with those people, you're less likely to get outside infection what happens if a new person comes into your social network, especially during a time right now when we're trying to stay socially isolated or separate from one another? Right, so I mean, the more you mix with people you're not used to mixing with, the more that you could come into contact with someone who has COVID-19. I mean, it's a new exposure if you want to look at it that way because we don't know everybody who has an infection. So trying to keep our social networks tight right now in terms of, right. in terms of who we're physically engaging with, that's a good thing to try, try and keep that tight without introducing new people into that. Right, that's what this is all about, is staying home, staying with just that tight, small group. Great, thank you, Dr. B. Next question is for the sheriff. Some employers are issuing letters to their employees um, who are currently working. This really is about people who are hopefully essential workers going to work on a daily basis because they're essential, but why would an employer be giving letters to those employees and are those letters needed in Stanislaus County? Yeah, I've had this, this question several times this week and the simplest answer is they're not needed. Uh, everyone still has the ability and the right to go out on the road. You can leave for essential services, you can leave for groceries, supplies, whatever the case may be. You can leave to walk your dog or exercise. Uh, that's right there in both the governor's order and with his, with his intent. Um, so no, a special letter is not needed. Now, what I tell all the businesses, there is no harm in issuing it, but again, everyone has the right to be out and about. Uh, again, follow the guidelines, maintain your social distancing, don't go out for anything beyond the essentials, and there's no concern about that. Great, thank you. Sheriff, we're gonna go back to Dr. V. 
great question on testing. We know there's a lot of questions on, uh, questions on testing, and thank you for your earlier answers for those. But this one is, why are you not releasing information on the towns where people who test positive live? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Um, let's start with uh, the fact that if you happen to live in a place that doesn't yet have a person who has been diagnosed who has tested positive, knowing that we're not going to get everybody who has um, COVID-19, um, we're not going to be able to identify them all because of the testing problems, um, you might feel that you don't need to be hit. So that's one thing. This could be very uh, misconstrued that, okay, I have none in wherever, and so I don't need to be concerned here. Um, Respiratory diseases don't, don't really look like that. They pretty much are considered to be everywhere and they're spreading throughout the county. That's one. Number two, and more importantly, um, is that we have this thing that we call, uh, well, privacy, but um, small cell suppression. So what we usually do is if there's any number for any place less than five, we don't report it. So right now with only 12 cases in the county, most of our cities are going to have numbers less than five, and that's done to protect patients' privacy um, so that you can't identify who the people are. Thank you, Dr. D. Mm -hmm. uh, another question from a viewer tonight. If someone already has already had and recovered from the virus, are they now immune? Great question. Um, so if this acts like other viruses, the respiratory viruses, the answer would be yes. This is, again, one of those things that time will tell, and um, we need to see how this acts and whether this causes permanent immunity. So I have to say that respiratory viruses, in general, the answer is yes. So we expect people to be immune for the rest of their life, but that has yet to be seen because that, that will take many years. Thank you, Dr. B. Uh, a follow-up question to some of your earlier comments. The question is a clarification on like six more weeks. Does that mean six more weeks or six total weeks in terms of how long we expect this to, to continue? Yeah, so I mean, we just started last Thursday, so they're almost one of the same at this point. Um, so the target date we're kind of planning for is May 1. And that sounds a ways away, but um, that, that would be about six weeks total. We think that's probably a good um, number to use to plan. Thank you. Dr. B, another question for you, and I think we may be on this for a few more minutes. Okay. Um, would do-it-yourself masks help elderly that cannot find masks? Uh, yeah. So uh, that's a great question. Again, uh, we're, there aren't really good standards for this, and we're trying to um, get some standards for do-it-yourself masks. So I know I've heard the governor talk about it, the garment district in Los Angeles, um, churning out masks, but we do need some standards, I think in at least thread count or something to make sure that they're actually gonna work to protect you. Um, and so I am waiting for those that guidance uh, and so that we can, I know there's a lot of people out there that wanna help out, I think it's a great idea, but I don't want people to waste their time making masks that then can't be used because they're not made of the appropriate material or made in the appropriate way, and I, I don't yet know what that is. Thank you, Dr. V. Question for the mayor right now. Mayor, how has the COVID virus changed the availability of city services? City services are still being provided and, and for the most part our citizens should not uh, notice any change in, in service levels. Our number one priority to the citizens is, is their safety. Police and fire especially uh, are responding as normally. Uh, and and all departments of the city are still functioning uh, for the what we have done is restricted is restricted public access into City Hall for city services but they're still available by phone and they're still available online so again there should be no real uh, real change in, in noticeable change in services for our citizens thank you mayor Question for Dr. V, can the county order a shelter in place for everyone except law enforcement, fire, medical, et cetera? Um, well, no. Um, so first of all, you wouldn't want to. Um, well, first of all, you can't. Second of all, you wouldn't want to. So um, 
you can't order the courts to close. They have their own uh, laws. So as a health officer order, I know I can't order courts to close. So that's one that can't be ordered um, because they have their own legal requirements that are outside of health officer. Um, but we also need our electricity flowing. We need our water flowing. We need our gas. If you know it doesn't warm up, we're going to have to still heat our houses if that's what we're using. So we have other infrastructure that is critical for us. We need uh, groceries. We need the supply chain for groceries to keep coming to the store. Um, so there are many essential services that must stay open, and it's um, not just a problem. So we wouldn't want to limit, uh, order everyone else to shelter in place, because there are quite a few other essential services that need to be kept going. Thank you. So a uh, clinical question for you, doctor. This is in regard to the long-term consequences. If a teen gets the virus, and then goes asymptomatic. They get the virus but no longer show symptoms. Um, can they get lung scars? Um, so I don't think anybody would know that. It's it, it, Usually the scarring in the lung is with more severe disease because the virus is attacking the lung tissue. You usually get sicker with that. So it seems unlikely. Um, of course, nobody knows how this virus will act. Um, so, but that seems, the, the sicker you are in the, in the hospital and um, the more likely you are to have some scarring in your lungs, but it's just not known yet. Great, thank you. Next question will be for the mayor. Mr. Mayor, the question is, are my utilities going to be turned off during this emergency? No, actually, we've suspended any uh, any turning off of services, uh, water, and and that type of stuff. Uh, and actually, we've we've actually turned some on that were recently turned off. So, no, they shouldn't expect any uh, utilities to be turned off. Great, thank you, Mayor. Next question will be for the sheriff. So sheriff, do sheriffs and correctional officers go through medical screening as well? I, I mean, can assume that means on a daily basis. Uh, yes, specifically to those that are entering into the custodial facilities, into the jails. Again, before they go in every day, they get uh, medical screening uh, to make sure that that vector does not enter into uh, any of our facilities. And for our operations staff, the folks that are out on the street, they have the option to go in to have it done if they would like. Uh, but it's, uh, the specific screening is about keeping it out of the jail itself. Great, thank you, Sheriff. Um, next question will be for Dr. V. Will physician offices for specialty services be closing at all? Um, so healthcare is considered an essential service. So um, it, I, I'm sure it depends on the specialty, but uh, in general, healthcare um, uh, offices are open. Great, thank you. Uh, we'll stay with you, Dr. V. Okay. Um, so here's a, a technical question right now. Do we know how many ventilators are in our county? Yeah, I'm sure someone knows, um, but I, I actually don't have that number. Um, but I'm sure it is known. Great, thank you. All right, next question will be for the mayor. This is in regard to the mall. Um, uh, is the mall going to be closing or are you going to close the mall? Uh, the, the mall has closed. They took it upon themselves to close down and uh, we did not have to do that. Yes. Thank you. All right, Dr. V, a question to you. Should high-risk people be concerned about a lottery for ventilators? So I, I've heard, yeah, I've heard things about that from Italy. I, I have no idea if they're true, but um, I would say the answer would be no. I think we have good, um, what we call our mitigation strategies, our, our stay-at-home strategies were implemented early enough that I don't think it's going to come to that in this county. I think we are going to um, go through this fine. We are going to manage our surge, and we will be fine. Okay, the next question I will direct to the sheriff. This might also be for Dr. V. Uh, the question is, are we headed towards a mandatory quarantine if we continue to see a lack of social distancing? Well, I think that's really gonna be more of a medical question. Uh, so I, 
But I have to defer that one to <laughs> Dr. Sure. D. So you it's, ask the sure, it's in terms of uh, quarantine. Yeah. And so, is there a, a, the question is, are we headed towards a mandatory quarantine if we continue to see a lack of social distancing? Yeah, so I would say no. Um, I, I, I think people are going to step up and do the right thing for the most part. Um, and so, so I would say the answer is no. So as the public health officer, what are your authorities for ordering something like that? Is that something, if needed, that you could do? Um, yes. Thank you. All right, question for the sheriff. Sheriff, what happens when our first responders get sick? Yeah, obviously that is a major concern of ours as well. Uh, and we, we have a plan in place for that. Obviously, from a medical standpoint, they will receive treatment just like anyone else would. Uh, but from a staffing standpoint, uh, obviously, if we have staff members who go out sick uh, or simply have to get tested or simply have to stay at home and wait out the, their symptoms, then uh, we do have ultimate plans for that. The number one priority uh, is kind of twofold. One is maintaining our patrol staff on the street. And, and two, and they're, they're equally important, but is maintaining our staff within a, our custodial facilities, those who operate the jail. So with that, uh, if we need to, and we have not done this, uh, but we will reduce some of our detective services, some of our special assignments, and they will go back to patrol to uh, work on the streets. Uh, and the same token is true in our, our jails. Uh, we have stopped all of our inmate programs uh, not because we don't want them to have their programs, but because we don't want to have outside uh, providers, outside instructors coming in to, again, potentially introduce uh, the virus. Uh, so some of the staff that are associated with, the, with those programs, they are now freed up to work uh, inside of our facilities. So uh, as we are currently, uh, we have a, a strong staffing plan. Staffing is not one of our, sh our short-term uh, concerns. And so uh, what we do, we have a kind of an incremental step process to make sure that we have enough folks who can work the streets. Great, thank you, Sheriff. Uh, Dr. V, question for you. What about, is it testing related again? It's a great question. What about people who have been tested like over eight days ago and still haven't gotten their test results? Well, um, hopefully they're better, first of all, and I'm sorry that it's taking so long. So um, we do know that the, um, commercial labs have had um, a huge demand on testing. And it's because of that huge demand, the uh, turnaround time has gotten quite long um, for many of those labs. And I know they were putting um, procedures in place to try to decrease that turnaround time, but I do know it got quite long for some people. Great, next question for the mayor. Is the Department of Welfare still operating right now? The county essential services are still in operation, as far as, yeah, as far as I know. The community service mm -hmm. agency is still operating. Mm -hmm. That is correct. I know some of their yeah. stuff has gone uh, telephonically as well, but they are still functioning. So thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Dr. V, back to you. Are there any plans to get masks delivered to grocery workers and others constantly in contact with the public? Yeah, so um, this mask question comes up a lot. Uh, so first of all, there is quite the shortage of masks, um, and we are trying to um, have a good supply for healthcare workers and others. So as far as I am aware, there isn't a uh, plan to supply masks to grocery store workers, so I think there's things that they can do. Um, these are our basic um, hygiene messages that we give everyone. Uh, stay at least six feet away from people. Wash your hands very frequently. Um, everyone needs to stay home if they're sick, both um, the, the employee and the people going to the store. And keep your hands away from your eyes, nose, and mouth. We've all figured out by now how really, really hard that is. Um, but, you know, getting virus on your hands doesn't, doesn't do anything. It's when you introduce it into your face that, that it causes disease. So um, th there are things you can do to protect yourself without masks. Another question for you, Dr. V. How long does recovery take? if you contract COVID-19? Yeah, so that depends. The sicker you are, the longer it takes. So for most people, in about a week, 10 days, you're feeling relatively back to normal. Um, but the sicker you are in the hospital, it, it can take a few weeks to, to get better. So it just really depends. Dr. B, another question for you. This is in regard to hospitals. 
We know that a number of hospitals in preparing for surge, you know, an increase of patients that will be coming, have limited the amount of elective surgeries or surgeries that aren't like emergently needed. Right. And so they're limiting that right now. Do we have any clue how long they will continue to limit those types of surgeries to prepare for surge? So there's a couple reasons for limiting the surgery. So um, number one is we want all the hospital beds ready and available when the surge comes. Um, another reason is those all use that PPE we were talking about that's in such shortage. So they're using the masks and the gowns and the gloves, and we need to keep those for the healthcare workers that are um, treating the, the, those people who are ill. So there's a couple reasons they're not starting, so uh, they're not going on now. So they will restart when the surge is done. Um, when if, hopefully we don't get much of a surge, but if we get some surge, it, they can restart when the surge is finished and when the supply of personal protective equipment is enough to support it. Great, thank you. Yeah. So back to you, Dr. B. Uh, why is there a shortage of tests? So we talked a little bit about that. So um, lot, there's a huge demand, right? There's just a huge demand. So um, laboratories have been working hard to meet that demand. Um, so there's a couple reasons. There's a worldwide, it's a pandemic, so every country needs to test and the supply chain is not built to supply um, enough tests for the entire world at the same time. So um, there's shortages of just almost every step in this testing process. Um, machines to run the tests on, people are trying to buy more, staff to run the machines, um, uh, and we talked about the swabs already and, and, and the uh, solution, you put the swabs in. And so there, every single step of it um, is, is suffering from supply problems because the worldwide demand is so high. Dr. B, I'm gonna stay with you on this. It's about the term shelter in place. Yeah. We've heard that a lot in the media. We've heard you know, to, to shelter in place. We've also heard the term stay at home. Yes. What's the difference between the two? What do we need to know about that? Yeah, so we really want everybody to shelter at home, I mean, to, to make a hybrid, but stay at home during this time um, and, and, and keep your mixing with other people down to the essential needs that you have. So groceries, an essential need, um, medical appointments that uh, need to happen are essential needs. So we want people to stay home. They, they really mean the same thing. Um, just, I think, stay home is just a clearer message than shelter in place. I think that could get confusing. Great. And for our viewer, viewers who are watching tonight, first of all, thank you again for tuning in. These are great questions coming in. I want to remind you, if you've joined a little bit late, if there are, there are a number of questions that are still coming in that have already been answered, so we can get to all the questions. We're going to encourage you to go back when we post this to view the entire, the entire stream tonight. So we're going to try and continue onward to answer the new questions that are coming in. Dr. V, this is in regard to the surge. When do you expect the surge to happen? Oh, that's hard. So, um, so hopefully, let's let's look at how we're going to approach this. Hopefully, um, we, there was some community transmission. We we've been having community transmission over the past certainly few days, and. We know that, that like every one person infects three other people. So then you get three people, and then the next time you get nine people, and the next time, nine times three is 27 people. So, I mean, it grows really quickly. So we're hoping that having people stay at home, um, we're stopping that spread and stopping that growth. So we would hope that if there's going to be a surge coming, it should, certainly should be within the next two weeks because we are now slowing down transmission, and so we're just looking at all the people that have gotten infected prior to um, really trying to cut down those social networks and decrease the mixing and decrease the spread. So I'm saying maybe in the next two weeks, and that's the reasoning I'm looking on it, but again, nobody can predict the future. It's just the way you think about when you think it's gonna happen. And with that question tied to it is the phrase, you know, flatten the curve yeah. that we might have heard. Can right. you explain what that is? Because it really ties to the stay-at-home strategy that's in place. Yeah. So how does that how, how does that work? So we talked about that one person infecting three isn't going one, three, nine, twenty-seven, right? So if that just continues without you trying to do any intervention to stop spread, it's gonna just keep shooting up and then eventually get to a point where it comes back down however long that takes and how many people it infects. 
we want it not to go real high, overwhelm all our systems with people being ill and not able to work, not able to provide health care. I mean, it just, it would, it would cut down on everything. So what we want to do is flatten that peak or flatten that curve of, of disease. So prolong the time it takes. So if you have 100 people and they all get sick in three days, we want to spread that 100 people over a couple weeks and so we can keep all our systems running. That's the flattening the curve that we're talking about. So if too many people are getting infected at the same time, that has the ability to overwhelm the healthcare system versus trying to slow it down right. so that's not a high spike, but it's a lower spike that the healthcare system can handle with capacity. Right, we know that more people will die in a bigger spike than it will if we can um, just flatten it out and we'll be able to care for people better. So it's really about keeping more people alive and health. Great, thank you. Another question for you, Dr. V. If you test positive, are you mandated to report that to your employer? You are not mandated to uh, report that to your employer. Um, so what happens is it, it is mandated to be reported to public health. And when we get these reports, we do a contact investigation. So we look at the places you've been. Um, if we do disclose this to your employer, we do have them sign a confidentiality agreement and there is also on there a, a statement about that you can't be discriminated against for that. So we do everything we can to protect identity and to ensure that there are no harms that come from this, but we do want to identify who've been exposed and so that we can um, let them know so they can be extra vigilant about their symptoms and, and, and make sure that we're interrupting spread at that time. Thank you, Dr. V. Yeah. So our next question will be for the mayor. Uh, Mr. Mayor, is an employer required to pay hazard pay to their employees during this time? Well, I'd first suggest that they talk to their employer and then uh, if they need additional information uh, they should go to www.covid19.ca.gov and there should be some information there for them. So. Thank you Mr. Mayor. So another question for Dr. V. How many tests in our county have been done and how many are pending? So we don't have all those data. When, um, when testing went through the public health labs, we knew all the tests that had been done. But since they are now going to many commercial labs or some hospital labs uh, are hopefully up and running, if not now, then soon, um, they don't notify us when they send tests, so we actually don't have those numbers. So Dr. V and uh, all of our panelists tonight, we're ending the close of uh, this evening's program. So I'm gonna leave a final question for you, Dr. V, right now. Um, we're talking about staying at home. We're hearing you know, messages from the governor to stay home. We've been talking about essential services. How serious are we at this point about people staying home and what are the impacts of not? So we need people to stay home. It is imperative that people stay home. We want to, um, and we will, we will get through this, but we want to get through this quickly. So uh, we, the more people stay home, the uh, more disease transmission is interrupted, and the faster that hopefully we can start reopening um, services, schools, um, churches, all of those things that right now are closed. Well, thank you to all of our panelists tonight. Thank you to you, the viewers at home, for joining us. Uh, for more information, you can go to standemergency.com. We also encourage you to follow Stan Emergency on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for all the questions that came in tonight. It was a great opportunity to hopefully address as many of those as we can. If we did not get to it, we're gonna work hard to respond to those posts online, and we'll send out information to those of you who follow us of where those questions are going, so you can see those as well. Uh, we'll probably be doing more of these in the near future, so we'll be certain to announce those to you also. Thank you very much for tuning in this evening, and we encourage you to stay safe and healthy.